African Baptist Church Sunday School for the 21st of May 2023 <clears throat> as presented from the Boyd Sunday School book Breaking Down Barriers and from the International Lesson and Ethiopian is Baptized a study from Acts the 8th chapter verses 29 through 40 but before we get started may I remind you that with the help of Second Helpings and other contributors to whom we say thank you so very much. We are still distributing food from our food pantry at our education building, located on the corner of Prince and New Street, right next door to the church. We do this each second and fourth Sunday from 12 noon until resources are depleted. The only prerequisite that we have is that you have a need and allow us to meet that need and follow the instructions as given by the distributors for their safety as well as your own. We say thank you so all to all of you so very much for your sacrifices and your faithfulness. Also, I would like to remind all of our friends and listeners and uh, our churchgoers that for the month of June, we will be blessed with the uh, uh, presence of our own elder Jason Parham, who will be presenting a series in our Sunday worship as well as in our Bible study on Thursdays, as for the entire month of June. And also, uh, yours truly will still be doing the Sunday schools for that month of June. Also, for the month of June, we will also be hosting. Uh, we'll be hosting Vacation Bible School for uh, the uh, children of the migrant workers that will be coming from Florida here to uh, FAB to Buford as they uh, work to provide us with the nutrition that we need in our, our stores and supermarkets, we will be hosting the uh, education of their children. Yours truly will be teaching twice a week, and we will truly be enjoying a true vacation Bible school. Thank you so very much for the privilege and opportunity that this has allowed First African Baptist Church. Now, as we go into the lesson, lesson eight, Acts 8, 29 through 40, let us read together these verses and pray, and then we'll go into our lesson. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? 
Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And may God add a blessing to the hearers and understanders of his written word. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the privilege and opportunity to present to these, your listeners, and even to myself, uh, this lesson uh, on breaking down barriers as we see the spread of the gospel went out even from Jerusalem and Judea, even into us, uh, middle and southern Africa to the Ethiopian parts of the nation, Lord God, through the eunuch and through Philip. Now help us to understand how your word is to be distributed and how you are responsible for the salvation of souls, but you have given us the responsibility of spreading the seed. You said one man planted, another man water, but you get the increase. And with that, we say thank you, Lord God, for using us and allowing us to be a part of this harvesting process. We thank you so much. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Lord, let the doctrine be sound and the words be precise and true. In Jesus' name we pray. The church of God said amen. Now, my beloved, let's look into the lesson in its context and the lesson proper to see how we also can break down barriers. Here we go. All right, my beloved, I'd like to introduce today's story with an analogy that's found in the book uh, uh, on the uh, international lesson. It's talking about tourism, religious tourism. And, uh, you know, the desire in the Christendom world is a desire to travel to the religious places, especially Israel, a place of religious significance that's ancient and yet still strong. But Historically, we refer to travel to sacred sites, uh, and we call that making a pilgrimage or whatnot, just like uh, 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 Islamic people uh, travel to Mecca and whatnot. But uh, many pilgrimage sites dot our world today, and for Christians, these include places like St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, Mount Sinai in Egypt, uh, Jerusalem, uh, 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 in locations uh, where Jesus is thought to have been uh, crucified and traveled, so on and so forth. People often testify that a visit to a holy site had such an impact on them that they were changed forever. And you find a lot of preachers and teachers offering tours in, 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 in times of the summer, tourism to go to uh, holy land sites and whatnot. They never, people say, forget it when they go. And our story today concerns the religious pilgrimage who, uh, a pilgrim who journeyed to Jerusalem to visit the temple some 2,000 years ago. Now, his pilgrimage to Jerusalem may well have been a once-in-a-lifetime journey, taking many weeks. We know very little of his lasting impressions of the Holy City, but we do learn of an encounter with Philip the Evangelist, not Philip the Apostle, but Philip the Evangelist that changed his life forever one that surely he will never forget. But let's start by putting this in context. Let's talk about Philip the Evangelist right quick. The central figure in today's uh, message is a man, and he's referred to as Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven as found in uh, Acts, the uh, 21st chapter, verse 8. Uh, and you'll find as compared to Philip the Apostle uh, uh, in chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. Uh, they are not the same person. Now, in addition to today's uh, lesson, other passages that refer to Philip the Evangelist is Acts 8, 5 through 6, and, and verses 12 through 13. And on the other hand, passages that refer to the apostle of the same name, Philip, is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts 1 and 13. 
Now, regarding the designation evangelist, we can also see that in Ephesians and in 2 Timothy. Now, it's tempting to refer to this Philip as one of the first deacons of the church, as the noun is used in Philippians 1.1 1, 1 and 1 Timothy 3, 8, and 12, but that noun does not appear in Acts 6, 1 through 6, although variations of the Greek word do occur in chapter 6, verse 1, ministration or serve or ministry in chapter 6, verse 2, and chapter 6, verse 4 also. But, you know, it's not saying that they were deacons, but they were uh, called out people to minister to the church. So that's how the church comes up with saying that these seven were the first seven deacons and whatnot. Here nor there, it really doesn't matter what they were called. They were men filled with the Holy Spirit and they were used in the administration of the church because the apostles were used to study the word, to distribute the word and to pray also. And they would not be called away as they would say in the terminology to serve tables. Now, like his colleague Stephen, which was one of the seven, the Philip of this lesson today moved from a ministry of feeding widows, Acts 6, 1 through 5, to preaching the gospel. Now, Philip was the first to take the gospel to the Samaritans in fulfillment of Jesus' directions in Acts 1 and 8. Now, this happened as a result of the persecution in Jerusalem. Now, during a highly productive ministry in Samaria, chapter 8, verse 25, an angel of the Lord directed that Philip go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem into Gaza, which is the desert, chapter 8, verse 26, the location of our lesson today. Now, let's put in context who this Ethiopian was in chapter 8, 27 through 28, reveals several facts regarding the man whom Philip encountered in today's lesson. First, he was from Ethiopia, a kingdom in Africa that is south of Egypt. This kingdom is also known as Cush, Isaiah 11, 11. Second, he was in a eunuch. Now, though some were born eunuchs or chose this status, Matthew 19, 12, the word most commonly refers to a castrated man. Eunuchs were found in royal courts throughout the ancient world. Now, the Greek historian uh, Xenophon wrote that Cyrus the Great preferred eunuchs in his court because he found them to be more reliable in general and trustworthy around women in particular. Now, the law of Moses restricted such men from participation in the assembly in, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So uh, this word eunuch here doesn't always mean that one that has been castrated it was synonymous also with one person that served as a treasurer or one in authority in the king's court also. So one theory is that this individual had purchased a copy of Isaiah because of its promise of inclusion of eunuchs, those who sometimes describe themselves as a dry tree, Isaiah 56, 3 through 8. And you can read that in the prophecy in Isaiah. And third, he was a servant to royalty. In particular, like I said before, he served the queen of the Ethiopians as one having charge over the treasury. So the word eunuch and charge over the treasury were synonymous with each other. He was indeed a person of influence and wealth. He would have had to be wealthy to purchase a copy of Isaiah, the great Isaiah scroll written in Hebrew and discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls measured about nine inches in height and 24 feet in length. That's a big scroll, amen, amen. So with that in context, we know who Philip is, the evangelist, not the apostle, and we know that the eunuch, preferably thinking that he was uh, in particular in charge of the treasury more so than castrated because he would not have been allowed into the holy convocation uh, in Jerusalem had he been castrated and whatnot. But here it is, we take off with the lesson, uh, chapter eight, verse 29, having I read that. Now, verse 29 said, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join yourself to this chariot. Now, the active role of the Holy Spirit is characteristic of the book of Acts. This is when the church started. Philip might have been intimidated by the splendor of the eunuch's chariot and thought any approach would be scorned. 
The God spirit, though, knew that the heart of the man in the chariot had been prepared by reading of Isaiah and so prompted Philip to approach him. The soil had been tilled. Now the planting and now the watering. The chariot, for its part, was not a vehicle designed for war, but for travel. It may be more like what we would call a carriage or wagon, allowing the traveler comfort while reading. And horses would have been pulling it at a walk pace or cattle, allowing Philip to run and catch up to it very easily. It's unlikely the man intended to ride this all the way back to Ethiopia, hundreds of miles in distance. It is more likely that he had purchased or hired the chariot to get him to a port on the Red Sea and travel and there, he would have been able to get a boat ride home. Never can tell. This is speculation. It's not in there on what he did, but that's the common sense rule that he wouldn't have ridden his chariot all the way back to Africa, but he would uh, uh, went by boat. And Philip ran there, verse 30, ran there to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, Philip could hear the man reading. This half verse tells us two things about the reading. First, the man was reading aloud even though there was no audience. He was a well-read man. People in the ancient world did not typically read silently to themselves like we, uh, 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 like we would in a public setting. Reading even for oneself was done by voicing the words out loud. This was slower but allowed for better understanding. When you read, it's good to be alone somewhere and read out loud so you can hear yourself. Second, the man had a copy of the, of the prophet Isaiah. I know it's spelled a little different, E-S-A-I-A-S, -A -A in opposed to I-S-A-I-A-H, which indicates a high level of education to be able to read it and the wealth to purchase such a large scroll. The second part of verse 30, and said, Understand, this is what Philip said to him, he said, understand thou what you read? Philip, trusting the Holy Spirit, interrupted the man with a simple question. To be able to read the text is one thing. To be able to understand it is another thing. We can read the Bible in a year, but yet never be able to understand it in, 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 in five years. That's why it's necessary to have sound doctrinal teaching behind what you read and not supposition and trying to Americanize a 3,000 year old uh, a book uh, with your own understanding. We need the helps, we need the study, we need the concept, we need the context, the whole nine yards. But in verse 31, this is what the eunuch said. How can I understand except some man should guide me? He had to understand that, you know, it's something when a person uh, knows that they need help and will ask for it, but it is a fool that know they need help and won't ask for it. So here's the second part of verse 31. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So the conversation joined fellowship. Although the Ethiopian had traveled to Jerusalem to worship, chapter 8, verse 27, and that lets me know that uh, uh, he would more likely would not castrate it because he would not be allowed to worship in the company of the Jews being castrated. Uh, uh, and had some knowledge of scripture, he was no master of the material. His plea for a guide indicated lack of in-depth schooling in interpretation as available in the great rabbinic schools of Jerusalem, such as Paul had with the school of Gamaliel. The man's hunger to understand prompted him to invite a complete stranger, as we would say today, giving him a ride in his car in his carriage. Now, let's see what he was reading. He was reading the prophecy by Isaiah in verse 32 and 33. Verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb, dumb, couldn't speak before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. Now, comparing the differences of Isaiah 53, seven through eight, with this quotation here, we understand that the reader had purchased a Greek translation of uh, Isaiah. This version is what we call the Septuagint. Now, as an official in a royal administration that had international dealings, it is not surprising that the man knew how to read Greek. He would have needed it for his business transactions. In God's providence, he bringing all this together, in God's providence, the man's encounter with Philip 
coincided with his reading of passage from Isaiah that presents one of the clearest prophetic visions of the coming Messiah. You see, in God's providence, from a babe, he raised this man, he taught this man how to read, he put him in that position so he could meet Philip one day and learn what the scripture was talking about in the gospel so he could spread it throughout all of Africa. Isn't that something? Verses from Isaiah 53 are quoted or alluded to nearly 40 times in the New Testament, making it a key text for understanding Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. The part before us is from Isaiah's fourth servant song, as it's called. That's Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. That text presents the Messiah as one who would suffer in accordance with God's will rather than serve as a military leader who would fight for the political independence of Israel. And that's what really threw the Jews off there. The imagery of sheep and lamb depicts the suffering servant as one who would not fight or protest while on the way to death, on the way to the cross. Luke's account of Jesus' trials presents him like this silent sheep, especially when he appeared before Herod Antipas. Now, in verse 33, he said, in his humiliation, when he was humble, he humiliated himself. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The key to the Isaiah passage is this word humiliation. A blanket word, a blanket word to describe the horrendous treatment that Jesus would undergo during his trials and crucifixion. Jesus was denied fair judgment. He was denied fair justice. And even though the Roman governor Pilate declared that there was no valid charge against Jesus, Pilate still consented to the execution of Jesus. That made it a case of judicial murder. Jesus, as the suffering servant of Isaiah's prophecy, seemingly had no hope of being the father of a future generation. But look at what verse 34 said. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, who is this talking about? Of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? In attempting to answer his own question, the eunuch reasoned that Isaiah must be talking about a specific and identifiable person. And in that light, the prophet may have been speaking of himself. That is possible, given that Isaiah sometimes spoke of his own experiences. But the Ethiopian prophet realized that the passage under consideration did not quite fit the prophet's situation. Therefore, he likely suspected some other man to be in view. His careful reading of scripture brought him to the place in context where he was open to hearing about Jesus. Isn't that something? Then Philip, looking for Philip with the proper interpretation and context. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. That's why we have to be ready, my beloved. We have to be ready to tell and talk about the scripture that we live and understand because ain't no telling what situation will come up where we need to tell somebody about Jesus or understand a verse that they may ask about. The very verses that had puzzled the reader served as the springboard to, to preaching Jesus. We easily imagine Philip using other verses in this passage as part of that presentation. Texts such as references to the Messiah as a man of sorrow, Isaiah 53 and 3, and, and, and who was... You know, we easily imagine Philip using other verses, like I said, as part of uh, that presentation text, such as references to the Messiah as a man of sorrows, the one who was born, uh, who has borne our Greece 53 and 4, as well as Isaiah's statement that God intended to make his soul an offering for sin. Now, the violence against the Messiah, as predicted by Isaiah, was a matter of historical record by the time of Philip's preaching. It is possible, it's possible that the Ethiopian, as a recent visitor to Jerusalem, had heard some of these facts, but there is more to preaching Jesus than telling the story of the Good Friday crucifixion. 
we must say also that Jesus was raised from the dead, just like Peter did in Acts 2, 32 and 36, that Philip did so as well is a safe assumption. We have to understand that. Now let's look at water baptism, uh, 36 through 40. Believe in verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What do hinder me to be baptized? Now, the assumption just mentioned that Philip's presentation of the gospel included things like Peter's address in Acts 2 is supported here. The eunuch would not have inquired about what hindered him to be baptized had Philip not mentioned baptism before the carriage came unto a certain water. Now, as with Peter on the day of Pentecost, the story of Jesus' death and resurrection leads to a call for belief in him, repentance from sins, and the cleansing of sins in baptism in that time. The believer can rest assured that his or her sins are forgiven and that the presence of the Holy Spirit will be given. Verse 37, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, Philip's response has a little not so fast, my friend, to it. One thing had to be certain that the man sincerely believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, a lot of older manuscripts said this, this scripture is not in there, but as it's in there presented to us, it fits, and I believe it's there. This was indeed the man's confession of faith. It meant he acknowledged Jesus of Nazareth to be the Messiah, which is the Hebrew word rendered Christ in the Greek language. In English, both words mean anointed one. That is the uh, irreducible content of the Christian faith, the belief that Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. And this is anointed in atoning death was the proper mission of the Messiah as prophesied by Isaiah. So what did the eunuch do? Verse 38, he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him, baptizo. Only after Philip was assured of the Ethiopian's faith did he agree to baptize him. There's no mention of repentance, but we assume the man's familiarity with scripture extended to the knowledge that repentance precedes forgiveness. Baptism is of no value without belief and repentance. An unrepentant believer who is baptized is no more than just a wet sinner. And although churches have different understandings of valid modes of baptism today, we see in the text before us the earliest mode of the baptismal action and one that is accepted by all churches even now, Philip and the man went down, go down into the water. The precursors of Christian baptism, which were the ceremonial washings by the Jews of the day, likewise were full body immersions experience. But we're not going to even divide over that, are we? So here comes the rejoicing. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. The end of this story is surprising, isn't it? Philip disappeared, and the eunuch saw him no more. Rather than be terrified or regretful, the eunuch continued his journey home in a spirit of rejoicing. It is not illegitimate to attribute this to the Holy Spirit in his life, for the connection between the spirit and joy is evident in both Luke's books, Luke and in Acts. Amen? Amen. Verse 40. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Azotus was the Greek name of the ancient city of Ashdod, located in the Mediterranean coastline of Israel. And from there, Philip made a coastal tour all the way north to Caesarea, uh, 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 Martima, a trip about 50 miles. And when we next read of Philip in Acts 21, 8, he is in Caesarea. And that was about 20 years later. So he may have made it his permanent residence after his ministry to the Ethiopian. We do not know, but we know that he was there. So in conclusion, uh, uh, we have this wonderful fulfillment in this uh, 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 con uh, uh, conclusion about Philip. And in that, we see how Philip, being a Jew, broke down barriers in this Ethiopian's 
conversion and in his baptism and in his joining of the church. Father, you plan for Jesus to come, teach, heal, and to go to the cross for our salvation. You plan to raise him from the dead. You even orchestrated the meeting of Philip with one who was eager to hear. We welcome your plans that include using us as ones who are ready to preach Jesus. We pray in the name as we prepare ourselves. Amen. We pray in Jesus' name. Jesus fulfills prophecies in ways that cannot be explained except as the providence of God. Until the next time, my beloved, we are quoting they all live. There is a golden